In this episode, you have the privilege of listening to a case live between myself and Simon. Simon has an upcoming interview with McKinsey and with KPMG. So we ran the case McKinsey style to make sure that he was ready for both interviews. It was a really dynamic case with a ton of math and Simon did incredibly well. I've known Simon since I met him in person last year. So it's been over 12 months that we have known each other. Uh, he was in a session of mine on an on-campus session back when we did those, back in the day, remember? And it was a really, really great session and we've stayed in touch since then. Simon has some upcoming interviews that are pretty important that he is gonna share with you about today so as we talk about what we're gonna focus on in the case. So Simon, I'll let you introduce yourself before I introduce what we'll do in the case and what we'll do today. Great, so hi everyone, I'm Simon. I'm a JD MBA student at Fordham and I have a McKinsey interview on the 16th and I'm interviewing with KPMG on the 8th. So looking forward to those two. Absolutely, me too. Uh, and so our focus for today is gonna be on the McKinsey interview, even though KPMG is no slacker. I'm gonna walk through this in a way that I think is gonna be maybe a little bit more intense. I'm gonna be a little bit more abrupt in the way that I'm thinking about things. I'm gonna to push to another level of insight. So uh, Simon, I think that this will feel like somewhere between a McKinsey first um, round and a KPMG second round, based on what we're gonna do in the session today. And so I'm going to introduce the case. I'll walk through the intro of the case. I'll set a timer and I will walk through how long it takes you to do each part of the case. At the end, I'm going to give you reflection on both the timing for each of the pieces as well as segmented performance. So we'll highlight what was happening in each part of the case. And overall, your mission is to solve the case, but probably most importantly, have a really good time. So we'll, we'll keep it lighthearted and fun. Uh, everyone who's watching, you know, you guys have the opportunity to do one half of the case, which is to work in your head and on paper with what you would do. Um, but please work along with us. It creates a better experience for you from the learning side. So Simon, are you ready? I'm ready when you are. <laughs> I've always been ready, born ready. Our client today is a company called Agrochem and the case is named Mango Maker. Agrochem is an agricultural chemicals producer based in North America. The company manages a wide portfolio of goods that includes specialty seeds for commercial producers, pest control, and soil additives. In R&D, this company developed a slow-release fertilizer that helps accelerate the ripening of produce. When produce goes to market off-cycle, it provides farmers with more assurance that it will be purchased and can even achieve a price premium. The product was patented 10 years ago, but has recently come back up into development as something that they would like to finish and commercialize. In testing, the chemical worked especially well with tropical fruits, and one of those tropical fruits is mangoes. So the company decided to call the product, for now, Mango Maker. The majority of mangoes sold in the world are produced in tropical regions, non-frost zones, and Mexico is one of the top 10 producers with 2.2 million tons produced a year. Your client would like to know if they should attempt to commercialize the chemical Mango Maker, specifically in Mexico. Do you have any questions about the background? Great. Uh, I'm first going to uh, run through what I heard from you to make sure that I heard everything correctly. So our client is Agrochem. They produce agricultural and chemical products, special, pretty much specialty seeds, uh, pest control, and soil additives. They sell these to commercial clients in North America, and they are looking at uh, bringing to to market a fertilizer which uh, works very well with mangoes and they're specifically going to launch that product in Mexico because that's one of the largest mango markets. And so the goal is sort of to see whether or not they should enter this, uh, whether or not they should bring this product to development. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely, that's it. Mm. Anything Great. you think you missed or any questions that you have about that? Mm. Sure, so just wondering sort of the size of Agrochem and their current their current size and generally how, how big they are uh, so I can understand how big of a deal this product is to their overall business. Yeah, um, I don't have data on it actually. Okay. And you know, normally I would, but I didn't pull it together. I think we can assume that it's big. 
Uh, this isn't necessarily a complete deal changer for them, so it would be a, a part of a portfolio of products. Um, so I wouldn't assume that it's everything. I also wouldn't assume that it's nothing. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, and do they sort of have a timeline of when they're expecting the product will be fully ready to launch? I think that right now it's gone through all of the testing that they would need. So I, I think we can assume under a year would make sense. Great. I'm going to take a moment to structure my thoughts and I'll let you know when I'm ready to work on this question. Sounds great. Can't wait. All right, Jane, Jane Ray, I'm ready. Sounds good. <laughs> ready for you. So there's three main things that I want to look at. The first one being the mango market. The second being deciding whether Agrochem is the right, uh, has the right capabilities. So looking at the company. And then the third is thinking about how to enter the market. And so starting off with the, man with the mango market, I want to look at the overall size and growth of the mango market in di different countries. I think that that would help uh, Agrochem understand whether or not Mexico is right market for them. And then I would also want to look at competing fertilizers to see their market share and see if this is a very fragmented or centralized a consolidated market that will impact how easy it is for Agrochem to break in. And then the third thing in the mango market that I would want to look at is whether who the major producers are of mangoes uh, and see if there's, let's say, very few mango producers and then it's you got to try to win contracts from them or if it's a very fragmented market and need a wide, a diverse marketing team, something like that. And so that's what I want to look at in the overall mango market. Then to look at Agrochem as a company, the, I want to look first at their financials and see how they've been doing recently. And also importantly, look at their cash position, see if they have enough money to make this investment and, or if it would, if they would need to take out debt and that would then sort of make the investment more risky. The second thing I would want to look at is their current capabilities in in manufacturing, distribution, and marketing to see if they can use the same capabilities with this new product or if they would have to create new capabilities. For example, if their Mexican distribution is not very strong, then they would need to build that up and that would be an additional cost. And it would also affect the timeline. And the third thing I would want to look at in the company is their current portfolio of, of fertilizers to see if this would cannibalize from other sales. Uh, if they are, if Agrochem is already the main player in this market, it, they would be taken away from their current revenue. And that's what I want to look at in the company. And the third thing, looking at how to enter, there's two main ways that I would think about right now of entering this market. First is to organically go in with distribution and marketing teams. And then the second way would be to license the product to a major player in the Mexican market. And so this deciding whether to do an organic entry or licensing approach would all, would sort of be based on the barriers to entry in that market and see if, if they're very high, then maybe licensing is better. And some barriers to entry could be, let's say, the government's regulation on fertilizers. And if it's really strict and the current product doesn't meet it, then maybe you license the product and uh, have that company figure it out. Sounds good. Where do you want to start? Mm. So I would first want to look at the mango market and try to figure out if it's an attractive market to enter. Great. I want to do the same thing. What data do you want? What kind of data do you think would be interesting and powerful here? So one of the, the biggest data point would be to look at the size of the market and the overall trend recently, and then compare that to Agrochem's like expectations for their for their return on investment to make sure that the market's big enough for them to actually, it, for it to be worth their time. Okay, and how are we gonna actually, what, what are the metrics that are gonna tell us that it's big enough though, specifically? Sure, so some metrics would be uh, market size in dollars, um, percentage change, from, change in market size from the previous year, and then also uh, looking at the number of competitors and their market share to see if it's a fragmented market, see how easy it would be to, how, how much market share we could reasonably expect Agrochem to be able to take. Good. Um, so I do have some data on the overall market. Let me give it to you now. 
Uh, mangoes are grown throughout the world, and the top five production countries control over 65% of the market. In total, it's 36 million tons out of the 55 million that are total globally. Our client for the moment is only concerned with Mexico as a test market. Um, what they figured out is some of the data on the market. So their Mexican producers can make average revenue of $6,000 per acre for mango orchards in a given year. The market is growing at about 7% per year. There are approximately 125 orchards in Mexico, and there are 250,000 acres that are devoted to mango orchards in Mexico. So how would you identify how big the farm market for mangoes is in Mexico? Great. So I think I heard all the information correctly. There was one data point at the end that I would like to clarify. There's overall about 250,000 acres dedicated towards mango production. That's is that right. correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. And the question that you asked was to see how, how much revenue is sort of produced in a single orchard. No, the question I asked was just how big is the mango farm market in oh, Mexico? Oh, how big mm -hmm. mango farm market overall? Okay, great. So can I take a moment to structure the logic of this math? Sure, a quick moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, sure. So overall, the market would be the number of acres available for production, which was 250,000 acres, and then $6,000 per acre for the overall size of the market. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the overall size of the market would be uh, $1.5 billion per year. Okay. What do you think about that? So that, that number is quite large. Uh, and it's also very, it's a good number because Mexico is just a, a very a, is a small part of the overall mango market in the whole world and so for a test market this is quite a significant size and it also would likely mean that it's worth the ag agrochem's time and effort to to launch it because this uh, my guess is that this is larger than most markets that they're currently in, but without more information on the company, uh, it would be hard to know. So let's just be clear. What is this market the market for? And is it the market that we're thinking about entering? Uh, so this, this is the market for, for overall mango sales. And we're looking to, we're, we're looking to sell, or the client's looking to sell a fertilizer, which would help improve the, the off cycle production of mangoes generally. And so the, the size of this market's good for the client because it means that mango producers in this market are going to be willing to spend money to improve their mango production. Gotcha. Okay. And so tell me what else you can see from this data on the um, kind of market that this is. So this for us, is... For agrochem, not for sure. not of mangoes. Yeah. Mm. This is generally a fragmented market because there's a... 125 different orchards. And so for the client to then go into this market, they would need to consider how to target many different orchards in Mexico. Uh, rather than if there were only five orchards, they would need to look at, it would be a different sales and marketing approach. And so having 125 orchards is probably a good thing for the client though, because it likely means that the, um, it, there's more clients to be able to take. If there were only, f let's say five orchards, they would probably already be locked up in, in contracts with other major agrochem players. And so with 125 orchards is probably more room to uh, start to develop market share. Okay. So interesting, um, interesting insights there. So, uh, you know, based on this, is there more data that you would want before you were ready to say, let's enter the market? If so, what would it be? Mm. Sure. So there's probably three different types of data that I would want to look at. First is the competitors. The second is the overall financials of the of the entry, and then third would be um, the general, I guess, 
what, what we're expecting the customers to, the, the customer benefits and their willingness to, to pay for this product. Okay. And so in, yeah. I have, I have some data on that. There are no competitors right now. This is a patented project. And it, because we issued the patent 10 years ago, no competitors have worked on developing anything that's similar to it or like it. Um, so, so that's, I would say in general, good news. Um, but then, uh, in terms of the customer benefits, we might calculate that in just a minute. Before we do that, I have a question for you. Um, uh, this is related to the customers, right? What do you expect the sales process would be like if we decide to pursue this product? You mentioned just a little bit about the fragmentation of the market. Um, what factors should the client consider specifically when they're thinking about building a sales pipeline for this product? Hmm. We'll be right back after this quick break. Have you ever heard a new digital trend and thought to yourself, okay, does this really matter? Asking the right questions helps you cut through the noise and get down to what matters most. I'm Jim Hertzfeld, host of the What If So What podcast, where we discover what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real by asking what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Subscribe and listen, and together we can turn big ideas into tangible actions so you can get shit done. Sure. So with 125 orchards in, uh, the, then each orchard is, it, none of the orchards are going to be in the billions or likely none of them are even in the hundred million. So this is small. I, I imagine that their, their, I guess, procurement teams are very small as well. And so I imagine that the sales process would be first developing a a marketing team that's pretty pretty large because we're going to need multiple sales reps, and then developing marketing materials that are uh, tailored towards the product and towards the local the the needs of the customer, uh, and then it would probably be g going from uh, sending the the sales reps out, trying to uh, convince them that this product is worth it. And that would probably need some forecasting on potential increased revenue for the customer and then securing hopefully long-term contracts or at least annual contracts with the, uh, with the orchards. Sounds good. Anything else? Mm. Yeah. So the, uh, the sales team would definitely have to consider uh, the the length of the patent when uh, considering contracts, negotiations, and the marketing materials. Because uh, depending on how much longer the patent is uh, the patent has, then uh, competitors may enter the market very soon. I imagine since the patent was ten years ago, I think patents are normally around twenty years, and so there's probably plenty of time. And so. Uh, the sales team would be able to tell the different orchards that this is going to be the only product on the market for many years and all of your competitors are going to be using it, so you should use it too. Okay, awesome. Well, you mentioned a little bit about the benefits to the orchard owners, but let's talk about that next. So there are two primary benefits that orchard owners get from this product. The first one is better consistency of the mangoes. Uh, the orchards split their harvest between the whole mango market, which is 75% of a crop, and the commercial food market, which is 25% of the crop. Uh, that includes juices, baby foods, and canned and frozen pieces. For the whole mango market, the farm staff sort through the harvested mangoes and separate any mangoes that are not ripe or that are deformed by pests. Our client's product protects whole mangoes from pest damage and improves the yield of the whole mango market by 6%. Um, the second benefit is increased sweetness. For mangoes dedicated to the commercial market, this product improves the overall sweetness. The sweetness does not seem to make a big difference to the whole mango market. Um, therefore, it takes fewer mangoes to make pressed products. About 50% of the commercial food options are pressed. It's estimated that the sweetness factor improves the yield by 10%. So what is the estimated incremental value for a farmer by using this product? I'm just going to repeat some of the information that you gave me to make mm -hmm. sure that I heard it correctly. Uh, 
the there's two main benefits to the to the fertilizer. One is that it improves that has better consistency. Mm -hmm. um, it protects from damage from pests, and then it improves the yield by six percent. Mm -hmm. And then for the uh, the second benefit is that it improves the sweetness, which is mostly for commercial use. And so, and that was for ten percent. Um, there, it improves and it, it by ten percent. Mm -hmm. By by ten percent. Okay, so the I would. In order to try to quantify the benefit, I would, uh, I would try to convince the, the orchards that since it improves the yield by six percent and improves the sweetness for co commercial use by ten percent, that it would increase their, that the first benefit would increase their yield would increase their revenue by six percent, or and then the second benefit would imp increase the commercial use by ten percent. So Simon, does that um, apply to the six percent and the ten percent apply to the whole yield and the whole revenue? Therefore, the ten percent definitely only applies to commercial. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that the six percent may only apply to general because the mangoes that are for the commercial use don't have to be as perfect, and so I would actually only use the six percent for the general. One of the most powerful and precious documents to many people is their resume. And because it's such a personal experience developing and writing your resume, sometimes you just need an outside opinion who can help you identify gaps and opportunities to really help your story shine. At Management Consulted, we walk you through two rounds of resume edits to help make your resume all that it can be for a competitive consulting job or more. Learn more at managementconsulted.com. That seems to make sense to me. Um, in addition, for the um, commercial market, there's uh, the only part that it really makes a difference for is pressed products. Okay. Um, so, which is only fifty percent of the commercial market. Got it. So, the six percent addition to the general to the general market is an increase in four point five percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, of to of the total. Um, How'd you get that? Just walking through the numbers. Mm. Sure. So I multiplied seventy five by six percent, or by by six, and or by six percent, and got four point five percent. Okay. And then for the commercial, I would multiply the ten percent times half of the commercial, which is 12%. And that would be an additional 1.25% overall. And so the general benefit of the fertilizer would be 5.75% uh, additional revenue for the, uh, for the orchard. And I think that that would be generally a significant amount. Uh, I think- What is that actual number? Mm -hmm. So I could turn it into, uh, I could do 5.75% times the 6,000 per acre and get a, uh, get additional revenue per acre, if that's what you're looking Sounds for. Sounds like good. Okay. So then 5.75% times 6,000, that should be an extra $345,000. And so, depending on the on what the client, what agrochemist is expecting to sell the fertilizer for, this could be a benefit to the to the orchards. And so, I would next want to look at the general pricing to understand whether the orchards would find any benefit from this. Okay, so we do need to determine the potential pricing as well as the profit of the product. Um, specifically, we're interested in identifying kind of an additional benefit that's related to that. So I have some more data for you. Um, the, the other um, benefit that is included is earlier harvesting. And we mentioned before that there was a potential price increase related to being able to harvest earlier and basically getting your product to the market off cycle. So our client gave a sample to the, of the product to a farmer that produces only locally. It's a small um, acreage of about 200 acres. The farmer was really able to harvest his crop about 30 days earlier by using the product. 10 of those days are 
within what we call the price premium capture window, where the farmer gets a 4% price boost. A study of technology innovation in the agriculture industry has shown that new products typically capture some portion of total benefits created for users. The standard median percentage is about one half. In addition, it's estimated that the product will cost us about $3,000 per kilogram to produce fully loaded, and that fully loaded cost includes transportation, warehousing, as well as sales and marketing. Uh, tests indicate that one kilogram of the product can support 12 acres of mango crop. So now my question is, how should we price it and what is our profit? Great. So there was a lot of data there, and I think I heard most of it, but I'm not, I'm, I'm honestly not sure that I heard 100%. So. Okay. The additional benefit is early harvesting, where uh, the orchards could harvest 30 days earlier based on the research that our client did, but only 10 of those days is in the price premium window, which was 4%. Then there was, there was a 1.5% in there, and I honestly didn't catch what uh, that study was. Yep. So basically a study of technology innovation in the ag industry. And there is a wide range of percentages. Basically, you know, there's a benefit to the, to the user, but then how do we price it is the question. Um, and so the median number is one half. Okay. So the overall price premium for the orchard would be 4%, but then the, our client would look to take about 1.5% of that premium. Um, not of the premium, of the total okay. benefit. Okay, total benefit. Great, and then the the cost to produce was 3000 3, per kilogram, and one kilogram supports 12 acres. Correct. Great, so here we have two separate calculations. One would be uh, the cost to produce, and then the... Second calculation is the additional benefit to the orchard. Okay. And so the addition, I'm gonna start with the cost to produce. And so we said that one acre, uh, the benefit was 345. No, uh, the cost to produce we have one kilogram being 3K. So the the calculation isn't cost to produce, it's overall like profit driven from it. Uh, and so I would want to look at the 12 acres multiplied by the th $345 per acre to get the um, benefit of one kilogram of, and then subtract that from the 3K to get the potential profit from one kilogram. We could do it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 345 times the 12 acres gets us a total of three, $3,840 as the benefit from one kilogram of fertilizer. We subtract that from the 3,000, we get $840 in benefit from the one kilogram of fertilizer to the, to the orchard. And then, okay. And then the second thing is the additional benefit of earlier harvesting to the orchard. And we have a price premium of 4%. And so we can increase the We can e increase the total yield from the acre by 4%, or the, the total price mm -hmm. by 4%. Mm -hmm. And so for one acre that was selling, with, if we had $6,000, we increased that by 4%. Uh, you get an extra $240. And then 1.5, the tech innovation from that, uh, the 1.5% that most people in this area are selling for is 1.5% uh, of the benefit of that 240 uh, to the to the acre, and so that would be a total of $90. Where'd you get the 1.5? Mm. 
So that was the average number uh, from the from the data that you gave me about General Tekken. It was one half, one half. Mm. Oh, one half. Okay. So, and basically, just Simon to to um, explain that. It, basically, what it means is that there's a value that's a benefit to the client, and we're going to give them half of the value, and we're going to take half the value. Right? We're going to price oh. at what what we believe half of the value is, so that they get okay, some of that that's fair. value. Mm-hmm. That's fair. So, in, in a general acre, the average benefit is two hundred forty. Is that it for oh. all general acres? Mm-hmm. Is that across the whole portfolio, or is that for some general acres? I think that was on the average acre of the of the market was six was six thousand. So I took four percent of the six thousand to get two hundred forty. And that would be um, true if we could price all of them at the premium. Can we price all of them at the premium? We can price the ones that are ten days that are in the price premium window, uh, which would be. Uh, 10 days of the price window times 30 days, uh, I mean, divided by 30 days earlier is one third. Um, is there some other factor that is preventing us from pricing all of them at the price premium window? It's just that if they, we can't, we can't actually get them all to the market during that period. So okay. the other 20 days will have to be at their original price. So only one third will be able to make it into the price premium window. Okay. So then we can divide 240 by one third um, to sort of add the average benefit for all uh, acres. And so that would be $80. Okay. And then mm-hmm. the average benefit or, or taking half of that benefit for the, uh, for the comp for the client would be $40 per acre. Okay. And so the, since one kilogram can provide for 12 acres, we would multiply that 40 by 12 and we get 480. Okay. And so the, we, we could price it somewhere, I would think between 800, we would price around 480. Okay, walk me through the pricing, just in sum. Sure, so the average benefit is is eighty dollars per acre because mm-hmm. to uh, and then taking half of that is forty dollars per acre if we were to oh we would have to sell it at three thousand four hundred eighty to cover the costs and take the benefit for the client okay. Um, three thousand four hundred and eighty. But but so far, um, like where does the three thousand come from? Where does the coverage for that come from? Hmm. I did this earlier. Okay, so the other parts, the other benefits for the um, for using the fertilizer. So the the benefit of better consistency and improved sweetness. Mm-hmm. Um, that was going to lead to $840 in benefit plus the $480 in benefit from the earlier harvesting. Those combined to $1,320 in benefit. So actually our client should be taking $680 of that benefit. And walk me through that $840 one more time. Mm. So that $840 uh, we got from... Uh, using three hundred forty-five dollars of benefit per acre times the twelve acres, so that was a total of three thousand eight hundred forty. Maybe there was no reason for me to subtract it <laughs> from three thousand, and so the um, actual benefit was going to be four thousand three hundred twenty, and then half of that is now I understand. Half of that is. <laughs> 21, 2160, which is below our cost to produce. There we go. What do you think? So it seems like we wouldn't be able to price it high enough to produce it. You sure? Mm. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're not sure of anything anymore, are you? <laughs> this got hard fast. So uh, three kilograms. I'm 
me take a moment to double check my uh, my math and logic here. I like your math. I'm looking okay. for insights. Mm. <laughs> so so the the client could price it higher. Uh, this 1.5% here is just an average. And so if we were to try to take more of the benefit, uh, then if the client was trying to take more of the benefit from the tech innovation, then it could uh, price it over the 3K mark. But then what, what the percentage would we have to be at? Mm -hmm. Right now it's 50 50. What percentage would we have to take of the benefit? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I'm going to divide 4,320 by 3,000. And no, I'm going to actually subtract it, then divide. So uh, the, I think, uh, 1320 over, we need to be taking uh, closer to, to two thirds uh, of the, uh, of the total benefit. Um, and that's just to break even. Uh, we uh, the client would need to be taking closer, uh, more than two thirds in order to have any profit from this, and that is, it may not be likely to to get that. Also, considering all the upfront costs of entering a new market, the the client would probably be taking almost all of the benefit for uh, to to cover all the uh, other costs involved in selling the fertilizer. Okay. Can you think of anything else that we should do? Based on the restrictions that we've placed on the the concept so far, is there anything that we should remove? Any other alternatives that we should look at, and et cetera? A main alternative that I had back in my structure was licensing the product and trying to find p potentially a, a different company that could, uh, that could sell this. Maybe they could produce it cheaper and so they would get a benefit. Additionally, our client could try to produce it for cheaper. Um, and a third option would be to and look at different markets other than Mexico where they may have a higher yield per acre. All right, like where? So there was tropical, it's a tropical fruit produced in tropical areas. And so uh, also considering the size of, of general economies, Brazil would be a very large economy to look at that Hopefully that likely fits the climate that would be necessary for this type of, uh, for it to produce mangoes. Okay, awesome. Anything else? Another option would be to test the, to test the mango maker on other fruits that have a higher yield per acre. Uh, there's no reason that I see to stick to mangoes, except there's been a lot of effort that's already been put into that. And so if, let's say, if this works well with other tropical fruits that have a higher yield, then that would make sense to me. What would be some examples of this? Other tropical fruits. Um, <laughs> I, papaya. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think dragon I fruit papaya. is a fruit. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, anything that would fit this sort of, this chemical uh, without knowing all the details of the chemicals, this would likely be uh, the other tropical fruits are the most likely candidates. There could also be fruits that would benefit from the from the benefits of the mango maker in uh, in ways that are larger than other tropical fruits. For example, earlier harvesting, this doesn't seem to be a big benefit for mangoes, but if it's a big benefit for a specific other fruit and this fertilizer could prove to give that option to that fruit or the the orchards of that fruit, then um, you could try to position this product in other markets based on the benefits to mangoes. Sounds reasonable to me. Okay, well, at this point, our CEO of AgroChem is interested in an update. What would you say to the CEO? Mm. Could I take a moment to structure my recommendation? Sure. One of the biggest challenges with interview preparation for consulting is knowing what you don't know. And the best way to figure that out is to work with an expert coach. You can work with someone on our team for just one session where they can give you ideas for where you can build your prep, or you can work with them for eight or more sessions to make sure that you're 100% ready for interview day. 
check it out at managementconsulted.com. So the, uh, unfortunately, the uh, we ran the numbers and it doesn't seem like it, it would be very difficult to sell the mango maker in Mexico because the benefit that the orchards get is not is not significantly higher than the than the client's cost to produce the fertilizer and so trying to take trying to get profit there uh, it would be hard to convince orchards to buy it uh, so the recommendation is to look at other markets where man mango maker could be more successful and uh, those other markets being other tropical fruits or other regions where they sell where they produce mangoes um, and so the the next steps would be to try to identify which markets to enter. One of the markets that we were talking about in our discussions was Brazil, and then try to do some tests and market research in those markets to make sure that it's a profitable market to enter. Awesome. You ready to be done? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome, Simon. Thank you so much. That was that that was maybe better than you thought, but um, I'm sure that people will kind of um, pop some thoughts for you in the chat bar. I'm, I'm excited to go through the background and the recap and talk through each of the pieces of the case. Before we do that, I'm curious what you think. What were your thoughts about it? So uh, I thought my, my structuring was generally okay. Uh, I was, I, I was, I'm generally nervous about my math, and so I'm looking. <laughs> and so uh, I'm not sure. I, what, while I'm going through these, I'm never sure that my math is right. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, it was it was nice to hear that that you liked my math. Uh, I I could tell that you had some uncertainty about your yeah. math. So <laughs> um, the question about the sales process, I think I wasn't giving what you were looking for. So I'd be interested in hearing about that. Uh, and then I didn't quite understand the trying to do that calculation at the end, but I got there in I don't know, a little under 40 minutes. So maybe it wasn't, uh, what it wasn't was too late. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't too late for you. Um, yeah. So that, I think that's really great feedback. Just, um, just question for you. What about the experience of doing the case like that? And with me, did you notice anything different about that versus maybe other practices that you can So there was definitely a lot of what else, uh, for, some of my when I was thinking about like brainstorming mm -hmm. um, yeah that that was the main difference and I I guess it's hard to stay structured in, in, in when you get what else because you want to just respond with the first thing that comes to your mind and I don't know if that's correct or not <laughs> great I want to talk about that specifically so um, overall, I just want to let you know, if that was the first round interview, I would have passed you on. I liked, I, I thought overall it was a really strong performance. I felt like you did, um, you know, quickly get the point, got the math, was it, we were able to capture everything. There was an appropriate amount of dialogue, a decent amount of structure. It was still a B. I want to get you to an A, right? Because we want to, we, we, we need you in that final round and we need you to be able to play in the final round. So let's, let's get the A. That's what we're going for. Um, there, it actually started at the beginning. There were just like little tweaks in a lot of the different sections. So I don't have any major, like you have to just burn this house down and build it back up again, but I do have tweaks in, in almost every piece. So for the first part, um, the recap, it was great. It took 41 seconds, super clear, um, kind of high level. I felt a slight lack of enthusiasm. I don't know if you were like, Oh crap, the case or, Oh crap, the audience or just, Oh crap, what? But, but I, I you actually, I just want to like really get a sense of your like uh, confidence in solving the case right from the very beginning. And I feel like you could have built that in just a little bit more in the early recap. Um, so you kind of talked about it at the high level and there's actually one thing that happened right at the very beginning. Um, that was an insight that I was looking for that I would look for in the second round. Um, and, and you never picked up on it in the case and I wouldn't have expected you to in the first round, but I just want to tell you what it was. So, um, Mexico is the fifth largest producer and I gave you some numbers right at the very beginning. I said, um, that they are 2.2 million tons a year. You didn't actually recap that number. And so later I gave you other data inside the case that said that the top five producers produce 36 million out of the 5.5 million total globally. And that probably would have been a clue to you that there are bigger producers 
of mangoes other than Mexico. And so that was like a second dairy insight that I just want you to start watching out for as you're practicing cases, because the more that you can pick up on those, the more that you can come up with alternatives or new ideas or the big picture insights that are really the game changers. Um, when you talked about the two clarifying questions, they were good, but not great. The good was that you asked them. The great would have been if you had told me what you thought and asked me to verify it. So you were like, how big is Agrochem? Um, instead, I would have wanted you to say, it sounds like Agrochem is pretty diversified. I would imagine that this product is not a deal breaker or a game changer for them. It's something just like a, that they're going through a standard process for, but I want to make sure that that's something that is appropriate in my set of assumptions as I'm thinking about it. So I make sure there's nothing that's kind of like grave, right? The, the whole success of the business or the failure of the business is on the line. I could just say yes to that instead of kind of explaining a bunch of stuff. I also get more from you. Um, the second question was the timeline for the product. So I told you in the background that there were 10 years on the patent. I don't know if you know this, but most patents are 20 years in duration. So it, like if you just had told me, I think we're a little bit under the gun here to make the best use of the remaining 10 years on that patent. So I would probably look at a one year launch process. Is that okay? Too aggressive? Anything else that I should be thinking about? So again, like just add a little more color right there in the dialogue at the very beginning. Your structure took you one minute and 39 seconds. It was a little too short. And the only difference that I would have made in what the content of your structure was, um, was specifically focus on a few more metrics. So I felt like you really hit a very good diversity of the concepts that you wanted to cover. And as you noticed, we fairly clearly walked through uh, some of the structure that you had developed. But you said, for example, competing fertilizers, right? Are they fragmented or consolidated? So just start that by what's the percentage of all of the competitors of fertilizer makers? Um, for producers, are there very few, right? Right, and I think like one of the other insights that you didn't pick up on inside the case that I was looking for you to mention at some point was that like, if there are 125 producers, there are probably only 20% of those that are like big enough for us to sell to or that would make a big enough difference for them to add a new product to their process or their, their, their pipeline. And so you kept talking about how the market was fragmented, but didn't really highlight like what percentage that would end up meaning in terms of, you know, it would, it would basically reduce some of the value overall in the market. Um, and then you, uh, when you were talking about the, um, like distribution and marketing teams versus licensing. I just wanted a little bit more detail on the data. And here's what happened. It took you three minutes. Let me actually just confirm this. Three minutes and 22 seconds to read out your structure, which is actually too long. So what I would do as a um, next step right after this case, after we get off the call, is go read out your structure under a two-minute timer and try to get it all out there. But one, the other final thing um, is that you numbered your categories very well. You did not number your data. And so I wasn't totally sure. I think I got it because you were fairly clear about it, but just as a safeguard, right? Data point one, data point two, data point three, when you're walking through your data, because it otherwise could sound like this big glob of data. So just make that super, super explicit, especially for McKinsey. Um, that great. And then we kind of go into some of the math questions. So the first, first math question, I would say that you got through to the level two insight, but not the level three. So that one was the size of the market question. And so you were like, it's a big market. And then you kind of heard me. I was like, but is it, you know, cause it, you, you were sizing the market for mangoes. Um, and that is, that's not the wrong way to size it, but then like what we really could have sized on top of that, there was a second calculation, which would have been the number of acres per orchard on average. Um, and identifying, right, there's 125 orchards or orchards, 2,000 2, acres per orchard probably would have made more difference rather than the 1.5 billion of the total market size. So I just pushed you on those insights there. I would want you to do those on your own. I would also, as just a tip for all of the math, you did an amazing job of structuring all three of the math questions. Although the last one, the structure, I kind of like interrupted because it wasn't the structure that I was looking for, but I still liked that you did it across the board. Um, one thing I would add to your structure is just like, why are we doing this? Right? Like, so tell me, you know, I'm going to do this math and this math, and here's what we're going to find. We're going to discover whether the market is big enough for us to enter. We're going to identify if the revenue in the market, um, you know, with some upside would be material enough for these mango makers to actually um, you know, change their production processes, right? Like, tell me what you're looking for in the data before you even get there. 
Um, I think your biggest opportunity for improvement is on the creative questions. And so um, for the first one, I, what, what you did was what I would consider to be the old school, non-virtual way of doing creative questions. You came up with a list. You were like, develop a marketing team, multiple sales reps, tailored toward the local market needs of the customers, focus on long-term contracts. And it was just like this like kind of rambling list. What I would rather have had you do, whether you take time, which you can in McKinsey, and whether you don't, which is better for KPMG, um, I would have rather had you say there are a couple of things that I would want to do with the structure. And I wanted more upfront structure categories that you then filled in information with rather than a list. You also never recapped and never prioritized at the end of it. So it kind of just felt like you were going through the motions rather than using it as a thought exercise to get new ideas on the table. The second one, the what should we do different, was a little bit better, but it was the same. It was super linear. So um, if you kind of said, hey, I think we've got three options, right? Produce cheaper, um, pro, you know, give someone else a license and they could produce it cheaper, focus on a higher like price point. Um, and then you kind of added the fourth one, which is the higher yield per maker. But like I would have liked some sub bullets under each one of those. And I would have liked for you to tell me that that was your kind of across the paper structure and then build it out a little bit further down. Does that make sense to you? Because I really want to make sure you catch that specific feedback. Yeah. Um, if the case was easier, I think I would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a I, 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 I know, I, no, I, I know to do that. Just when, when the questions are hard, it's harder to come up with the categories. It's easier to come up with one-off ideas, I think. Yep. Yep. And so, um, so if you do it that way, then kind of come up with one or two. And then when you feel like you're start, starting to diverge from it, call that category like, okay, so those are ideas for marketing. Let's talk about the sales team, right? Let's talk about partnerships. Let's talk about capabilities of the sales team. Like once, once you like build the first one, that's okay. Name it something, but then go on and build some other ones as well. Um, so your brainstorming for each time was like under two minutes. That's why I what else did so much. Um, and so you're going to get fewer what else's if you're more comprehensive in the first place. Great. And then the final um, math question, um, oh, oh, sorry, the, the two benefits to the orchard owners, I thought you just nailed that one. Um, I, I just want to make sure that you know, you can do as much recapping as you need to. So that was the one where I had to clarify that it was like 6% of the 75% and then 10% of the 50% um, of which was also of the 25%. So you actually kept really good, clear record of your math at that point. But I just would want to make sure that you recapped it adequately. So the fact that I had to jump in there, it was like a little ding, not not bad, but um, but it would have been better if you didn't need to do that. And then finally, on the final math question, this one was the doozy, right? The, the kind of like, the I gave you both costing and a pricing benefit, both in the same thing. Um, and so you got a little bit lost in that one. What do you think happened there? Was that note taking? Was that recapping? Um, what, what, you know, what was kind of the, was it, um, I, I, I intentionally, by the way, because this is a McKinsey style case, I mixed up the per kilogram and the per acre to make you put them into the same metric sizes. So was that the funky thing that happened there? Was there something else going on? I, I think realizing that my, the first math I did was for the first two benefit or adding all three benefits together. Mm -hmm. That that's what took me the longest, and then realizing that some of the math was only for the first two benefits. Um, maybe it was also about staying organized, and honestly, I may not have a hundred percent understood the business model. I felt and like that, that at what the beginning. Yeah, yeah, totally, <laughs> yeah. totally. Um, I haven't, I'm a haven't done a tropical. Word, so. <laughs> <laughs> haven't done a tropical fruits case. So. Weird, right? Weird. You know, that's that's one of the reasons why this one's such a fun one. It's quite an equalizer because there's not a lot of people that are like, huh, I had an internship in agricultural chemicals last summer, right? You know. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't necessarily apply. This would be the one that I would go back and redo again. Um, and just, uh, you know, you can either listen to the recording or you can just do it on your own now that you have the data and just work on kind of um, walking through the interpretation again of it. And, the, and then like telling me again, why are we calculating this? I think if you add that to each one of your math questions, it's going to help clear up what you do. So that one took a really long time. I think that one took us right over, over eight minutes. 
Um, and that was like, that was back and forth and this number and what about this one? And what about the insights? And I was like, really, you know, not letting you go on that one. That's one of the ways that, by the way, if that's happening, you can know that you're doing well in the case. If somebody wasn't performing as well in that, I would be like, Hmm, what an interesting number. Let's move on. So, um, the fact that I was kind of pushing back on you was not a bad thing. We had the second question around the, like, what else should we think about doing? Um, and then I thought your final recommendation was strong. The one improvement I would have made to that is just provide what I believed could have been a more adequate recap of what we'd done in the case. You kind of dove pretty strongly into the recommendation and then the next steps and really missed out on like, here's what you looked at. So I would have either put that before or after the recommendation and prior to the next steps. So I hope that that insight and feedback and those tweaks are helpful and productive for you. Do you have any questions about this? This was a great learning experience. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I understand the feedback and I'm looking forward to hearing the recording. Also not so looking forward to it, but uh, this was very interesting and something new, which I'm glad I Good. got to do. Um, Simon, I have a question for you. So now you can reveal to us how long have you been prepping? What have you been doing? Because I, you know, I think that was a great example for a lot of people to see. So what are some of the things that you found successful um, as we move into the final Q and A with the rest of the group? Yeah. So I did the black belt program last summer and then uh, sort of took the from October to April, May off. And then uh, I honestly didn't put in enough time last summer uh, in, into the black belt program. Still need to do stuff outside of just working with the coach. And so I learned that for this year. And so I've been doing some practice cases with other people who have interviews. I, I've been working with the coach this, this round or this, uh, this recruiting cycle. And then I've been trying to write out different uh, different frameworks and not to memorize them, but I think it helps to have like a really broad sense of what you're of what you're doing and why. Um, for example, for for this case, I, the really broad idea is uh, is this the right market? And then can can we do it? Is does it make sense? Is it feasible? And then how how should we do it? And yep. so, and, and to, I love this one. This is a very like business fundamental case, right? If mm -hmm. we can create value for someone else, we can capture some of that value. It's kind of one of those like very basic concepts. One of the reasons I love business, right? You know, the whole reason that a business should exist is that it's creating value for somebody that they're willing to pay for. It. Thank you, Simon, so much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this great live case done with Simon. This McKinsey style case is just an example of all the great content that's on the podcast. So if you liked this episode, please make sure you subscribe, share, and leave us a review. In addition, if you would like to be on a future episode, either as a live guest for a case, or if you know someone who would be a great live guest for our general strategy conversations, please reach out to us at team at managementconsulted.com. We hope you'll join us for future episodes of Strategy Simplified. Thanks for listening.